Hey everybody, welcome back. So here at the end of 2019, it has been a really rainy last few days in Western Washington, uh, pretty much going from bone dry to flooding here within just a couple of days. And I thought what better time to talk about one of the biggest safety issues that comes up in electronics and electrical systems than water. Now there's a lot of problems that get introduced with water, but the one we're gonna to cover today is water and grounding issues, or more importantly, a particular device that they've designed in order to protect us against those grounding issues. It brought to mind somebody brought up a, a question about these particular devices a while back, and so I thought it'd be a good idea to address it in a video. Those devices are uh, this, this thing called a ground fault circuit interrupter. Probably really familiar, you've seen them in your house. The uh, common one, normal modern ones have a little green LED on it uh, and you'll recognize it probably from your kitchen or your bathroom and really specifically anywhere where water would be present. So that's why around kitchen sinks and bathrooms, these things are going to be really important. But instead of just describing what it does, thought it would be kind of cool to tear one apart and actually see what's inside of it. So long story short, just to give you an idea of what they do, uh, when we have current traveling through the wire, it goes from the, what they call the hot or the live wire uh, and goes out through the load device like a light bulb or a, a heater, a hair dryer or whatever, and then comes back through the neutral connector. At least that's what should happen. Now, in some cases, if for some reason in that device, a wire is loose and that hot wire is able to make contact with some other path of electricity, it can get through that, uh, through that other path to another place where it might return back to ground. Now, if it's sufficient enough, like if it's directly shorted to ground, then almost instantly it would bro blow a circuit breaker or trip a circuit breaker. Uh, this, that's exactly what the circuit breakers are designed to do. If there's an excess of current, it stops the flow of electricity. But the problem is it takes far less than that 15 or 20 amps to injure or kill somebody. So what do we do to protect somebody from those cases, especially where water is present, which is a very easy, convenient path for something that is charged with that live wire, the hot wire, as a nice path back somewhere else to ground that can be harmful or fatal to somebody. So they invented this device called the ground fault circuit interrupter that's able to detect even a couple of milliamps and immediately cut off the flow of electricity if any more than that is detected. Now, it doesn't matter what the current coming from the breaker is limited to. So that may still be 15 or 20 amps supplied to the circuit, but that ground fault circuit interrupter device is able to protect us if any imbalance in current is seen that's in excess of just a few milliamps. So it keeps it immediately to a safe level. And if anything more than that is detected, it can trip much faster than most mechanical breakers can. So let's go ahead and tear this thing open and let's see actually what's inside of it and have a look at why it's so good at doing what it does. Now at this point, you can see the reset button and the test button, and we'll see from underneath when this next layer is removed, the test button is able to simulate a little bit of current flow between the live and the ground and would trip it, where the reset, which is, um, which is popped back up by this large spring here, that's the one that's always gonna be sticking out a little bit further. Now as we're gonna see in just a second when we get to the bottom of it, uh, the reset button can't actually be pressed until there's power applied. Uh, and it's gonna have to do with a little bit of a, a coil plunger that's inside, uh, but we'll see that in just a second. Let's keep tearing this apart. So this piece right here, I guess, is really what you'd call the, 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 the guts of it, the operation of it. Uh, so if it doesn't look, well, okay, it kind of looks complicated up here, but flip it over and we can see that I, I was even surprised taking this thing apart at really just how much is going on on this circuit board here underneath. I knew it was going to be complicated, but this is a little bit more uh, extreme than what I was expecting. But let's take a look at what's going on here. So first of all, when you connect a GFCI outlet, a ground fault circuit interrupter, it's very particular. In fact, this little yellow sticker that I tore off tells us which of the connectors is supposed to be going to uh, the connectors going back to the breaker versus the connectors that are going on downstream. And the reason for that is that um, these two up here, 
uh, they are connected to the live power, which means that they are going to be powering the circuit board underneath. If there is an excess of current and the whole thing trips, we want power to be removed to anything downstream, including this outlet, but we need to make sure that we're still powering the circuitry on the back, which is doing the monitoring. So that's why it's really important that power gets applied from the right direction. Now these two coils inside here, one thing about coils, if you saw my induction video, uh, when you send current through a coil, uh, it generates an induced voltage. Now a lot of times that's used for sensing current, not actually necessarily accomplishing a task, but I'd say sensing is a, is a pretty useful task in its own. These two coils sense the amount of electricity going in from the hot wire and coming out through the neutral wire. Now really those should be the same number. If the circuit is operating properly, then we should have the exact same amount of current going out to our load device as coming back from our load device. Right? It should be equal amounts of current. But if there's an imbalance, then we want the circuit to turn off immediately, even if that imbalance is just a couple of tens of milliamps. So that means we need to be able to sense both of those quantities. That's what those two coils are accomplishing inside here. Now they're sensed down here on the bottom side of the board and they're going to this chip which is called an operational amplifier. An amplifier takes two voltage quantities which are coming from these two coils. It compares those and if they are equal then it allows current to pass through the rest of the circuit as normal. If they are not equal to each other uh, that's why they call it a comparator. An op amp is a comparison circuit because it compares the two values and will cause it to trip much like if you press the test button manually, you're simply simulating that. Now this thing right here, if you're familiar with relays, this actually looks a lot like a little plunger, a solenoid inside a relay, and that's exactly what it is. So it energizes this coil, which is again why it's really important that we supply power the right way because the power from the circuit is going to be sent to this plunger, which is then going to activate the plunger. And just like where we can manually do this from our reset button, the plunger goes down into here and, oh, it's really hard to do when everything's disconnected. But you can see what happens. I'll show you what happens when I lift up on the reset button. You hear that click? And you see a little tab right here coming into contact with the tabs that go down to the rest of our circuit, the stuff that goes downstream. Now here, this is the actual contact part. This is where your, your stuff is actually going to plug into your circuit. And if we line that up, you'll see that, that when we connect our test button, you can see that that other pad right down here, that little contact pad, makes contact up here so that our stuff that's actually plugged in stays connected to power unless something happens, it trips, and now it's disconnected. Not only disconnected from this outlet, but also disconnected from the rest of the circuit, which again is why we need to make sure that we install this thing properly. If we just look at a regular outlet, this is just a standard run-of-the-mill outlet, those two are attached together. This is a giant jumper bar right here. We, we really can't get it wrong. Uh, as long as you connect the live and neutral to the correct sides, but it doesn't matter which one is connected to the one going off the wire going off to the breaker or the one going off further downstream. This is going to be a, a much simpler device to connect. Whereas this one, due to the fact that we need to be powering that circuit board underneath, we need to ensure that it's all connected properly and, and not just the right sides with the silver and brass screws, but also making sure that it's connected in the right direction which means we need to pay attention to that little sticker that shows up on these that tells which ones are the load terminals under this label for feeding additional receptacles. That was under these ones that you can see are disconnected if that circuit trips. So it's a complicated but really fascinating way to ensure that we supply power to the circuitry 
but we can discontinue power both to the outlet itself and to all the outlets downstream in that circuit if something happens, which in this case that something would be a difference in current between what's coming into the circuit going off to our device and what's coming back to the circuit through the neutral. The only other alternative there is it found an extra path somewhere else to ground, which is probably through water. Not always water, but usually that's the case, and that's why it's a requirement to install those anywhere where there's water sources nearby. It's also recommended to use GFI outlets anytime you're working outside. Sometimes if you get a nice extension cord, it'll have a GFI breaker attached in line with the extension cord. So as you can see from this from this quick illustration, uh, there's a lot more behind devices and when we're doing electrical wiring than just getting the electricity to go from point A to point B. Obviously that's the end goal. We do want to supply electricity where we need to, but we also really need to be aware of some of these unusual devices and what their task is. And this particular case is one of the really confusing ones, mostly because ground itself is a confusing subject and not enough time to talk about the entire thing here. But at least if we can see this device and tear it open and see what's inside of it, it might be a little bit easier to track down some of the problems that might be occurring if we hook it up and it's not operating the way it should, or we press a test button and it's not operating. It, it kind of gives us a little bit of an idea of why we should pay attention when these sort of things are happening. So I hope you've enjoyed this. And if you have any other ideas of some videos that you'd really like to see, some other devices that we can tear into so you don't have to go buy your own GFI outlets to tear into, uh, you can if you want to. They're a little bit more expensive than other ones, but I, I just love tearing into stuff. It gives me a little better idea of what's going on inside of it. But if you have any other ideas for videos, just let me know and I'd love to prepare something. Uh, and hopefully you you and anybody else could be really interested in seeing what's in, in the, the behind the scenes of some of these parts. So uh, thanks for watching. Have a great day uh, and go build some electronic stuff.